It's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode number 230, the 10 worst cars of all time. I'm Cars Guide deputy editor, James Cleary, and joining today to look at the world's biggest automotive clangers are key contributors, Andrew Chesterton. Hello all. And Byron Matthew Darkus. Hello there, everyone. We'll also take a look at the fresh metal we've been driving this week and unearth the comment of the week. YouTubers, you can jump ahead to each section of the show via the time codes in the notes or chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. This is going to be a subjective call. So your criteria for 10 worst cars can be looks, dynamics, sales, or anything else. And all vehicles are eligible from the dawn of the motor car. Um, each of us has identified three cars and we don't know each other's nominees. What we do know is there are no double ups or overlaps. So the plan is to take turns announcing a contender until nine are on the table, then a jointly agreed 10th nomination rounds out the list. So I want to start with you, Chesto. Kick us off with your first contender for worst of all time. All right, let's do this. Now, let me start by saying I found this really difficult to, to, to get this list together. And I, I was sort of really struggling with what criteria I was going to go with. And what I decided to go with in the end was something very simple, how it made me feel to look upon these vehicles, to, to see a photo of one, to walk past one parked on the street, or very rarely to see one actually driving. So the first one, I'm going to throw it up. This is a, a Q&A session or a guest session, I should say. Okay, like, very good. Who am I? Uh, so yes. It's a vehicle described by Auto Trader as the most embarrassing car you can buy. Austin Allegro. Incorrect. A vehicle that looks a little bit like an Arnold Schwarzenegger bowel movement. Whoa. Um, the electric car from the 2000s. I can't remember. Sinclair. No. The, no. A, a, car, a vehicle that could have talk. Sinclair C5. Yep. Anyway. Would use the word bro. Oh. Um, and you'd like it to. A Dodge Nitro? Close. It is the Hummer H2. Oh, Hummer H2. Okay, very good. Abomination. I think it was built between 02 and 09 from what I could find. Had a big, thirsty engine, but was as slow as a wet week, 0 to 100 in about 10 seconds. It was also enormous, <laughs> famously fairly difficult to drive, and, and it went out of fashion faster than breaking it's true. Scenario. But you're right. I mean, Arnie was an ambassador for Hummer, yeah. I think, in the US at least. Yeah, um, I, and it was built, it was GM vehicle, but built under contract bar, I think, or built under... Uh, yeah, well, I, I am general did... Uh, eventually become under the control of I, th I think general motors board of general motors yeah so yeah. And, and it used what is essentially an old silverado maybe yeah. um Not sure. platform. Um, damn it there i was gonna um include a hummer in my one but because ah. ah, it, so, it went it went yeah. humvee then the civilian version was the h1 and then they went through the numbers right two mm. and, and three yeah. that's right so it was it was confusing um, so yeah, that, that was the big one icky doesn't it that car it makes you feel icky looking it's, at it Ugh. As a cyclist in Melbourne, occasionally oh. one passes me that's a wow. men's party stretched limo yeah, version. Yeah, I've seen that in Sydney too, yeah. And it just is, it, it's gauche beyond belief. It is yeah. this, it takes up so much road space. And um, yeah, one broke down um, while I was at a pub with our co colleague Tim Nicholson uh, several weeks ago at a roundabout and we had to push it. Oh, oh dear! Fantastic. <laughs> oh dear! That's a task. Luckily, the hens weren't in the car yet because otherwise it would have been pushing hard. <laughs> Mate, those All right, are incredible. That's good. Next. Now, Got next one, we're going to we're going to keep going oh, around. Okay. So, I'm Go around. next okay. up. I'm going to hit up Byron for okay. your first nominee, please. Okay, so for me, uh, for me, it's how the car made me feel and its um, impact on the uh, on the buyer experience and mm -hmm. what. It may and and how far from expectations this thing uh, failed to uh, well fell. So okay. Um, so my first car that I'm starting up, I'm starting is the Peugeot 1007. Wow. This was a uh, a city car uh, from a I don't know maybe that they were drunk from all the 80s and 90s accolades and. And and you know, or, or just drunk at lunch. Yeah, just drunk at lunch. Yeah, but Peugeot and Citroen decided, look, we're going to make um, premium city cars, uh, release them in the mid two thousand. So probably developed during the dot com boom of the late nineties, early two thousands, before everything went pear shaped. Yeah, and they must have just been using cheap drugs and expensive <laughs> hookers because the Peugeot one thousand and seven resolutely did not meet the basic brief of a city car. So we're right. talking about a. I uh, know oh maybe a 
uh, Toyota Yaris size car mm-hmm. with a sliding side door Man, that took yeah. That it was measured with an hourglass. It was so slow. <laughs> and, and now I now look. I don't mean to sound like a tosser, but I was in Paris, and when I drove this car in its home market, home ground advantage here, and it just did not work as a city car. It rode terribly. Was gutless because it had a robotized gearbox. Robotized gearbox is yeah. what the hell. And it was so. So as you drove past, people were not throwing their berets in the air. There was no no <laughs> celebration. No, no, but they were trying to poke it with a with a baguette. So oh, it was terrible. Brilliant. And the car, but we did get that car's sister cousin, the Citroen C. I want to say C two or C three Pluriel. Okay, yep, Pluriel. Yeah, yeah, which was another take on the same theme um, by pretty much the same group of designers and engineers, and it was a monumental fail. City cars should be comfortable. They should be um, enhance the enjoyment of, of traveling not um, and, and getting from point A to B, not um, being a, uh, you know, a, a liability. An impediment. Like, an impediment, that's the word. Perfect. I would rather walk, in fact. So okay, all be. right. Look, thank you, Byron. Thank you, Chester. I'll, I'll go with my first uh, submission. And it is the Sanyong Static. And okay. in... Other markets, look, I'm going purely, this is how superficial I am. I'm going purely on how these cars look. Yeah. And to me, it was 2004. That's a car that was finished, but then someone decided it had to fit 11 people. Yeah, um, <laughs> just reminding myself. So th- th- there, were, there were seven, nine, and 11-seat configurations in this thing. <laughs> it was designed, believe it or not, by Ken Greenley, who was the former head of automotive design at the Royal College of Art in London. Wow. It is. It looks like actually what would now be a fastback SUV with this weird, strange extra bit plonked on the back. Yeah, it was an abomination. Like a little semi that's been renovated, hasn't it? Was, it? Yeah, it was terrible. It was like the the builder that does their own plans for the uh, extension on the house. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it it was terrible. Um, had a Mercedes Benz deal for the engines. It was when um, Sanyong was kind of in in that mode. And I think it was a massive fail on one of the worst cars of all time. I like all right. It. So now we're back to you, Chesto. We've got three down. We're up to number four. And I'm nothing if not superficial. So this next one is based largely on, on what I, what it's like to look at as well, JC. So I'm taking a leaf out of your book here. And, and this is one, look, it, it looks a little bit like a Transformers kind of stuck in <laughs> transformation or suffered some kind of injury. The same car that taught us that retro and cool don't necessarily go hand in hand and was filled with the kind of quality plastics that usually wrap Zupa Dupas. It's the Chrysler <laughs> PT Cruiser. Wow. This is, I think, Byron, from the early 2000s to about 2010. And from my reading about it this morning, it was Chrysler's attempt to try and surf the nostalgia wave that appeared with cars like the Mini Cooper and the VW Beetle. And it did work. You know, it worked in that sense. It all made us a bit nostalgic for a time before it existed. But that is my second choice, PT. It it, it was a time, was it not? The guy, uh, we'll get to this later, but the guy was Brian Nesbitt. He he designed it. And it was the era of the Prowler and the HHR and all of these kind of retro futurist uh, vehicles that were taking a lot of their cues out of hot rodding and and, um, all of that stuff. Byron, I'm sensing you're no, agi- I, you're agitating here. Oh, have, you, have your I, say. I, look, I, I I totally disagree. I think this is one of the future classic underrated cars of that period. Whoa. The car was exceptionally well packaged. Like you could remove the rear seats because it was a tax break if you can have an SUV uh, or a crossover with seats that can be removed, the rear seats, because mm-hmm. then it was in class quite as a passenger car. Now it's an American tax kind of break. Anyway, as a result, the car was really... It really could be a panel van and it handled well. I think it did retro better than say the contemporary Beetle in that it was only thematically retro. It wasn't actually um, um, paying homage to any particular model from the past. It just, it was a, a, a feeling of, of something. And I actually think that um, that history has been quite kind to this car's design. Uh, well, look, look, let's 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 keep it moving. I'm sorry to say, Byron, um, I'm with Chesto. Two versus one, you lose. We're I, we're I, moving. But I haven't we, even mentioned the wood paneling yet. Let me oh think. my god! <laughs> I don't I don't care. I don't care how practical it is. Um, I I'm was, not getting in that car. I thought this was a democracy, not a cheerocracy. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, keep okay. going because we're moving on from Chesto to your second nomination, please, Byron. Oh, yes. Okay. My second nomination is uh, the Hummer H3. So this is a smaller brother to the H2. It actually 
made it to Australia, sold here fairly reasonably well in the late 2000s before uh, General Motors pulled the plug on uh, Hummer after its uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 2009. Yep. It was based on the American Colorado from that era. It was built in South Africa. It had a nail of an engine, a five-cylinder turbo diesel, and it was woefully unreliable. It didn't <laughs> wow. ride. It didn't handle. It was badly built, and it simply, it simply was just one of the worst cars I had to test. So many on. ticks in the plus um, column. And, yeah. um, and I've got to say, I was with a colleague on the international drive of that car on a straight freeway <laughs> in America, and the car's pitching was so bad that my colleague uh, actually uh, stuck their head out the window and um, and vomited. Oh, wow. Now, look, that's, right. a, that's a convenient excuse because I'm sure the conversation was going in a certain <laughs> direction. Or <laughs> well, maybe it was my driving. Yeah, but anyway... Right. The, the car, it, it's one of the most hateful. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. Great nomination. Thank you. I, I, I'll go with my second one. That's the Lada Samara. Okay, so uh, we're talking 1988 into the early 90s and, and a bit beyond, actually. Um, made by a mob called Autovaz um, in Russia. Uh, the factory was 1,000 kilometres south of Moscow. But Lada Motor Cars of Australia was in Port Melbourne. Um, operated by the Dreyfus Group out of France. Now, the Neva, which was a 4 by 4 had a good reputation. There were lots of dealers. And uh, there was optimism that this Samara would compete with, you know, entry-level cars like the XL, the Hyundai XL. Mm -hmm. Sedan, Hatch, there was a Cabriolet um, for $15,000, early 90s money. They even turned it into a, band, a van, the Busy, B-I-Z-I, -I, the Busy. Uh, for $9,000. It was a 1.3 litre single overhead carbureted four, five speed manual front wheel drive, 48 kilowatts, 95 Newton metres. And I had the dubious honour of driving the Samara Deluxe by Brock. Um, so Peter Brock had split with Holden in 87 and was going broke soon after. He picked up the gig to do quality, quality control and pre delivery on these cars, which allegedly involved rehanging doors, um, putting better fasteners on, rewrapping wiring looms. Um, and his car, the Brock Deluxe, had the same engine. He looked at the suspension. I'm sure he just made it was all bolted, to, made sure it was bolted together, put alloys on it, 13 inch, running 175 rubber. And it was one of the few cars that while I was test driving it for a week, it started to fall apart around me. It was, yeah. and despite best efforts, from his business to make sure everything was bolted down and together, it was so badly built, it just disassembled itself while you drove it around. It was appalling. And the performance was shocking. You never see him. And I think that's, uh, that's testimony it. to just yeah. how uh, dire that thing was. Well, allegedly, it took years to move the last you know, batch of cars that was in, in stock. But it was good looking. It was designed by, I think, Jerry was... It had, some, it had some alleged Porsche involvement yeah, Porsche, too. Uh, Porsche helped with the uh, development right. of the engine, apparently. And uh, I think a, that was the intern. And yeah, and you know, I think the potential was there. The ingredients were there for it to be what you said it might be a um, a people's car from from the you know from behind the Iron Curtain. But yeah. in the end, the curtain really needed to go down on that car quick. Well, start. it did. Yeah, that's right. So there's that one. There's that one. Good. Okay, we've gone around again. Chesto, your turn, please. Okay, lucky yes. lad. And look, I feel a bit guilty about this, but I am making it a US hat trick. I uh, This car very much is based on not only what I think looking at it, but but also the people who've been driving it, usually behind me on a freeway, one inch off my bumper, being total. Okay. Uh, well, you got to mention an Audi, Boche. <laughs> <laughs> So now this is, I, I've described this as the car you bought when you somehow thought a Hummer H2 was too cool for you. Oh dear. You had a jaw liner to make a Bond villain jealous. It was the Dodge Nitro. Oh boy. Yeah, I, I, we got another one. Oh, beautiful. No, no, I'm really wrapped. That's good. beautiful. I agree. Yes. yes. Uh, and look, it, I, I, uh, it, I've, I've been doing some owner, owner readership reviews in Australia and the US. People complain about electrical gremlins, quality issues galore. It's very lowly ranked on the quality scale, but it's also just a hideous, hideous thing to look at. I think it was based on a the, the idea a shoebox. 
<laughs> with, oh, a, with a big jutting it, jaw. Yeah, yeah. The, wasn't it based on the Jeep Liberty slash Cherokee, the KK? I mean, the design. I think the design was supposed to be a, a, oh. a drag racer, basically, is the, oh. is the inspiration for that horrific long jawline. Mm. The Wouldn't front. there have had to have been a limited edition called the Circus, the Nitro Circus? <laughs> I mean, it, that, that, that car um, sums up um, toxic masculinity. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pleased to hear you say that, Brian, because I felt a bit guilty saying that I'm basing it on the people who bought it, but I am because that and that's the reason. Why. Needlessly aggressive. <laughs> no, nah, we're into sociology here. That's fine. Awful. We can we can yeah. uh you know case study that. All right, that's good. Great one, Chesto. Byron, we are back to you. Okay, now this hurts me to say this because I have a fondness for this mark. All right, but the car that I feel fell so short of expectations from a car maker that was that was so good at making cars in this class for decades and it's actually a car you can still buy new in australia or there would still be a few left in dealerships that car is the 2012 to 2021 mitsubishi mirage oh wow a vehicle that was so appallingly uh fell so appallingly short of expectations from a car maker that that not only made uh great cars like great city cars like the original colts yeah but also made a an icon a 90s and 2000s icon in the um in the three door mirage mm. it was it was a car that clearly was developed on a shoestring budget had quality cut out of it was overpriced fell under engineered and really one of the worst new car experiences. Um, it got the lowest score in a comparison I did for when I was doing Cabarrus for Wheels um, against its um, quite ordinary competitors. It was just a dire, a dire experience. Its only redeeming feature is that it's reliable and it uses um, not so much. It doesn't use much fuel, but it Brilliant. really is well, just a like the most disappointing car of the 2010s for me. They were fairly openly targeting, I think, the title of Australia's cheapest car at the time. Right. But it was all right. price point led. And it certainly had that. I mean, I was there when they revealed that car. I think from memory it was New York or, or maybe LA show. Mm -hmm. And you could almost see the cartoon stink lines coming off it as you walk past it. Like, wow. It was, yeah. it was wow. And, wow. And, and, and yeah, exactly. Incredible. And really badly proportioned and, and, and awfully designed. I just feel that it, uh, undermine Mitsubishi and just it, it, it's it was it was just a woeful experience I'm sorry if you own one or you have to drive one <laughs> very good okay Let's, hold on, Mitsubishi. here's here's the ninth I'm going to chip in with the ninth it's the Aurora safety car of 1957 out of the US it was created by father Alfred Giuliano who is a Catholic priest um, it was arguably the first experimental safety car in the world and I was just thinking whilst researching it, it must have been the inspiration for Erwin Worm's fat cars. If you've seen those installation artworks yeah. where he just bloats cars out and makes them yeah. soft and blobby. He's done a 911 Cabrio and various others. They're hilarious. He's done a fat mini. In fact, it did a fat mini in a fat house driveway. <laughs> um, anyway, this was built in 1953 on a Buick frame from a wrecked car using a fiberglass kind of uh, and plywood superstructure or fiberglass over plywood. Plastic windows was 5.5 metres long. It took him two years to design, apparently, and three years to build it. It was going to be $12,000 in 1957, which was the same dough or just under a Cadillac Eldorado Brougham, which was the most expensive car in the country. But he was going to promote it as dent-proof and corrosion-proof because of, you know, the fibreglass body. And he said he had a deal with General Motors, compared himself to Preston Tucker, um, he was investigated ultimately by the IRS, accused by the Catholic Church of misappropriating parishioners' donations, what? and forced to leave Church. the he forced to leave the Order of the Holy Ghost. Um, now it's Go currently ahead. restored and on display in the Bewley Motor Museum in the UK. It there was only ever one made; it was never sold. It was one a prototype, enough. and it is horrendous. 
Did, did it serve as the inspiration for Penelope Pitstop's car in the I don't 60s know. cartoon? I don't know. Who, whoever, whoever actually restored it, I think, should be shot at dawn because that <laughs> thing deserved to go in the bin. It was, it was awful. I, I, just, I, 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 I admire the termination, but the car is horrendous. Someone here has written that it, the idea was clearly to make a car so ugly that other drivers would instinctively veer away from <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's beautiful, Satan. The, the project was scrapped when real-world testing revealed that drunk drivers would actually swerve into it. <laughs> James, I, I thank you for... Um, Show me a car I did not know exist. Yeah, no, it's, it's awful. Not. It's awful. Um, I think it's possibly the worst. Anyway, it's also got a bit of the Simpsons bubble car in it too. I wonder. If it's there was terrible. Oh, yeah. it. it's yeah, terrible. The, the home, so, you mean the home? Yeah. There we go. Now we've put our nine on the table. We're going to go a quick fire SmackDown round uh, to get our tenths to round out the top ten. So Chesto, and then we'll have a quick vote at the end. Chesto, hit us I've with gone. your extra. I've gone the Cherry J11, a car that was famously exported, imported, then rapidly exported from Australia when they found it was still constructed using asbestos in its component Nice. Tree. So uh, as we said earlier, it's a car that could actually kill you while it was sitting still. Correct, which is, yes. a, which is a special title. So, yeah, that, that gets my ticket. Beautiful. Um, let's go, Byron. What are you at for your extra one? I was going to say Nissan Almira from 2012 to 2016 because for reasons that are very obvious if you, if you look at it. But <laughs> yes. I'm going to, but, but instead, I'm going to give a special mention to all the Daewoo based Holdens. Wow. Sold yeah. here and um, starting with the Captiva. So the Captiva is, is, is it. A yeah. vehicle that I think undermined Holden's reputation so badly that yes. uh, the, 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 the brand could just couldn't recover. Yeah. I think I think it was very telling and very Aussie that it, it kind of organically picked up the nickname Crap Tiva. That's yeah. right. That, that yeah. says yeah. that speaks volumes. Yeah. And and when it was and given that it was pitched against one of the greatest Australian vehicles ever made, the Ford Territory, um, yeah. it just showed where the two companies were, uh, how Great. far the Great. two companies were. And by the way, I, and I've got to mention the Epica and the Viva and the yeah. TK Barina, which was called the Epica yeah. Fail. By the way, Epica failed, yes. yep. and the whole that was a limited that was a limited edition. Yep. Yeah, as as um, as honorary mentions within those uh, rubbish Daewoo very good holders. Yeah, they, 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 beginning of the end, that, beginning the of the end. Yeah, yeah. Marina with the big chrome wheel still haunts my nightmares. I must. Oh dear. Yep. Oh dear. All right, now I'm going to put in my uh, ninth, which is not a single vehicle, but it's let's put it under the title of awful convertibles, ill-advised convertibles. There's obviously a cycle here. Every six years, someone in a car company has a brain explosion because in 2005, it was the Chrysler PT Cruiser convertible. Sorry, Byron, I hate it. Um, then in 2011, the Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet, like that was apparently Carlos Ghosn's idea because his wife was interested in some kind of convertible car. Um, and then it, it was actually uh, the Range Rover Evoque convertible in yeah. 2017. So Next year, we are actually due a rubbish convertible. Oh, hang I mean, on. You're forgetting the Volkswagen. Was it a T-Watt convertible? There is, isn't there? Great. There Let's chuck that in there as well. So <laughs> I, I think out, out of those, it's got to be the Nissan Murano. It, it is an awful, chubby, you know, badly proportioned thing that just should never have seen the light of day. And I can imagine the Nissan uh, design and engineering team just going... Yeah, look, the boss wants it. We've got to do it. That's not something they, <laughs> yeah. they would want to do of their think, own volition. I think they looked at a full nappy and thought, hmm. Mm. Can we, can <laughs> That's inspiration that right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what do we reckon, Chesto? Just remind us, yours was the cherry? It was, um, but I'm changing my vote now to the day we were inspired Holden Range, which, had, which I fine. think I blocked out, but I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll put a vote onto that, I think. I'm with you. That's it. That's our 10th. Fantastic. Thank you. What a great conversation. And I'm sure people listening and watching will have their own opinions. There are so many options out there. There's our 10 for what it's worth to get the conversation started. Um, but we are going to move now to our very own garage where he, we have been driving current vehicles. Well, actually, Byron, in your case, it's not quite a current vehicle yet. Tell us uh, what you've been driving. Okay, so I had the pleasure of driving the upcoming Ford Ranger wild track v6 so it was a late stage prototype i drove it in november last year and i drove it uh, with a couple of a few other journalists at ford's proving ground uh here in melbourne at the yu yangs yu yangs yep uh -huh. and uh it was uh, we were the first people outside of ford to drive the car uh this car and particularly the v6 engine on the famous durability circuit which is where um you know the Falcon escapades of Falcons and territories, yep. yeah. Oh, the Falcon escapade in in nineteen sixty four or sixty three, yep. I think, where they uh, where they 
basically fix the Falcon's reputation on this really demanding track. So it's a high-speed track. It's got a lot of yumps and bumps and uh, high-speed curbs and um, parve Belgium parve um, style cobblestone yep. blocks and all that sort of stuff. Yep. And it was a it was a great demonstration because we drove the prototype and a an existing PX3 wild track with the two liter by turbo engine mm -hmm. uh, to just to see the differences between the two cars. And I've got to say, on that durability circuit, it was chalk and cheese. I, I was I'm still very impressed with the current Ranger, uh, but then stepping up to the new model, wow. I realized that the considerably um, more powerful engine combined with the wider tracks and the um, reeds and pretty much everything redesigned in terms of suspension and steering and, and, and what have you have, have, have created a, a vehicle that just kind of pushes a bar out. It, right. it, I'm not going to go and say it's car like to drive, but it really behaves like no truck I've ever driven at wow. those speeds. Awesome. It is really okay. planted and, and, you know, this is on you on four by four tires as well. So, and speaking of four by four, uh, then we went off track, did the same uh, sort of exercise, new car, old car to see, to compare the two and um, the extra wheel travel from the front suspension, because it's it not only has been widened, but um, it's been cleared of, um, you know, engine. I see. And, and, yep. You know, that sort of thing, and the new four by four system, which is a um, an electronic system, um, it all comes together and coalesces into a vehicle that is significantly um, more capable of uh, of going off road. Great, and uh, so I know under control conditions. I know we're, dri we're driving million dollar home um, handmade prototypes, so you just don't know what the real thing will be like. And that, well, we will in a couple of months time or next month when we, we drive the first of the three T62 products, but first impressions, extremely impressive. And well, I think, I, I think it's worth pointing out that um, your video of that experience and um, some words to accompany it are available yeah. on the site or YouTube or wherever. Sorry, Chester, I probably uh, cut you off there. Were you about no, I was just going to say, I can't, I can't immediately think of another brand where a single new model is as important to its ongoing success. Yeah, so true. True. Mm -hmm. so true, so true, so true. I'm pleased to hear that it uh, lives up to the hype. All right, yeah, so check absolutely. out check out Byron's Byron's details on that um, on the site, video on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chesto. Um, on to you. What have you been steering? Less new, but still kind of exciting. I jumped in behind the wheel of a Hyundai Sonata Inline for the first time. So Inline is a bit like the AMG Line packs, I guess. It's the yep. uh, it's the almost N in the Hyundai family. So not a full blown performance car, but not too far off it. Uh, and this is a little sporty, rorty, quite fun little thing, actually. It's a 2.5 litre turbo engine, 213 kilowatts, 422 newton metres, which is 20. quite a lot. Yeah. Quite a lot yeah. for, for a car that size. You bet. And it, and it feels it too. It is a, it's a really fun, uh, a reactive, exciting kind of car to steer, even on a daily commute. The downside of all that is <clears throat> I think they've dialed the sportiness up so much that it is actually fairly uncomfortable. It's nigh on undrivable in its hardest settings on like crappy urban roads, right? but even in, in its normal or almost comfortable settings, it, it can be a little jarring. So you're definitely trading off ride yeah. comfort for a sense of sportiness. But here's something I've never said in the, in the podcast before, but I think it's more relevant now than ever before. It drinks 91 Ron or E10 fuel, which is actually genuinely a consideration now. that It is so much. Forward. Absolutely right. Yes. Okay. Very good. That's uh that's excellent. Thank you. I'll chuck in a car that I was able to drive at its launch uh, during the week, which is the new Jeep Grand Cherokee. Um, this is the L version. I know, Chesto, you were over in the States and, and drove different um, configurations of this car. Okay. But the first, the first one we're going to see is the Cherokee L, Grand Cherokee L. Three models, evocatively named Night Eagle, Limited, and Summit Reserve. I hate You're talking. You're talking 80K through to 115K. Now, they're exclusively powered by that 3.6-litre Pentastar V6, which is an evergreen um, engine, improved along the way, but, geez, it's been around for a while now. Um, Eight-speed auto, 210 kilowatts, 344 newton metres. It's all-wheel drive, of course, and it's a seven-seater. Mm -hmm. So that's where the L bit comes in. This is a market that they haven't been playing in. The big change is in the interior. It's more mature and a premium feeling interior. There's lots of equipment. That money is fairly substantial, I agree, but there's lots of equipment to try and back that up. 
we took it off-road through some serious forestry trails and, and challenging sections, and it was on street bias tyres, and it did so well. Mm -hmm. um, the lower models have a single-speed transfer case. The, the top one has a dual speed with low range, and it made all the difference. Incredible off-road. Mm -hmm. um, and it was practical. It's composed on the road too. Uh, the price, uh, it's pricey, but big, 5.2 metres, 2.2 tonnes. Um, there's not a lot of road feel through the steering. It feels fairly balanced um, on the road, but you, you're guiding it rather than steering it, and there's not a lot of feel coming through the steering wheel. Um, you can hear that induction noise from the Pentastar. There's no diesel or V8. If you want a diesel or a V8, um, Jeep won't be able to help you. There is a Hemi in the US, but not here. And they're still offering just 100,000 kilometre warranty, you know, five year, 100,000. So that's a bit of a shortcoming. So they want to challenge the big players. They're even hinting around, you know, German big three and all of that. I think that's a tough ask. Mm. But um, this car has more of what it takes to make that a possibility, I suppose, um, if that's the aspiration. And I James, I'll car just... in the States as well, JC. And I, I got to say, mate, it's, it's thirsty too. It's still thirsty that yep. the engine is part of the problem, even in the plug in hybrid variant. But mm -hmm. one huge wrap I'd give it is the third row in the seven is possibly the best third it's row. It's so I've good. Seen. I agree. I could sit bolt upright yeah. on 183 centimeters, I could sit bolt upright, heaps of leg room, Plain and, and really well equipped USBs like and vents and yeah. Mate, it's an awesome, awesome third row. Uh, James, I might just correct you. you oh. You've forgotten about the short-lived Jeep Commander from 2005 and 2010, the, the, the last seven-seater SUV. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Well, let's say, let's say this is the first seven-seat Grand Cherokee. Yes, we'll say that. How's Mate, that? Look, it's light years ahead of the car that's going on. <laughs> that wasn't until very recently. Totally. And I don't know whether you agree, way. Chester, but the interior is like coming out of the dark ages into yeah. something that's actually contemporary. And this so, is a tiny thing as well, but I mentioned actually in the review of the 4 e the, the interface, the digital, the, the, the screen interface for driver and passenger is super slick. Yep. Quick, fast. And they've got this thing called fam cam, which is like a uh, in the top middle, it's a rear camera. So you don't have to turn your head around to look at the kids or whatever. It just yeah. shows you on the screen what's going on in yeah. every position. You can switch between positions. It's oh, good. One more thing to distract yeah. the driver. Distract your driver. Okay. Like one more screen to look at. That's look, great. Look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's look. Let's leave it there. We'll go to feedback, comment of the <laughs> comment of the week. It's on top of the shipping container at the front of the Cars Guide forecourt with bunting around it, balloons. It is serious. So Hammer Rocks came in. Last week, we were talking about JDM, Japanese domestic market cars that should come here. Um, and Hammer Rocks had the valid point of view. He said, one JDM vehicle not mentioned that I wish we got officially through the manufacturer in Australia is the Honda E. Sadly, the new price of a grey imported car is just astronomical at 80k plus on-road costs. I think we've had some mail lately that you shouldn't absolutely write the prospect of the Honda E coming here uh, off um, out of hand, but you write, right now you can't buy one. Mm -hmm. Cook chimed in and said he saw it in Frankfurt in 2019, and it is super cool and practical, and I agree with him. It's such a lovely little car. It, it would be one that would encourage a whole bunch of people to embrace oh, yeah. uh zero emissions cars because it's so cute and and so efficient yeah. it's also the only car i've seen that does camera exterior rear vision mirrors correct you know how ah. they've got cameras instead of mirrors yep. um, Audi yep. e is an example of one that i think falls short yeah that honda yeah. e does it well absolutely. so many of them you, because you don't have any depth of field you don't have any kind of anything to judge your vision against it's just this flat kind of view of what's behind you. So they can be a little bit disconcerting, uh, concerting, I've found. I, I it's just think it's not a uh, SUV, to be honest. I know the uh, the, the Cupra Born will be a, a sort of electric hot hatch when it arrives here as well. But for, for like my wife and I, for example, we don't need a car the size of an EV6 or a, or a uh, Ionic 5. The little Honda would be right in our wheelhouse. Yeah, you even got a dog that's Honda E sized. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Corgis, yeah. corgis are perfect for that. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Now, um, um, what I want to say now is, with that, we've reached the finish line. Hey, so it's it's time to say thank you, Byron. Thank you, James. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Chester. Thank you, everyone. This I think this will be controversial. I can't wait to see the comments. <laughs> and thanks to our production tinkerer, foliage grader, and dog surfing instructor, Mr. Pritchard, for his savant-like skills in pulling this show together. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, I'm into fitness. Fitness burrito in my mouth. Um, beer pants and goofy sandals. Yes, they're awkward, but it's actually the Disney character. Um, jump into the conversation, Cars Guides on Facebook and Instagram, or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. 
Listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five is the preferred number of stars. Thank you. And viewers, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, was in my GP's waiting room uh, this week and a supercars mechanic I've seen around the traps walked in and sat down. Tried to have a chat, but it was difficult, which made sense when he told me he'd come in to be assessed in relation to a claim for industrial hearing loss. Yeah, said he'd applied for compensation, but so far hadn't heard anything. Oh, Are you mining the dad joke? Yeah. Um, I'm, a like a bit, Look, yeah. I'm a dad. We definitely mind the dead something far. <laughs> Did you say dad or dag? Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs>